Thank you. Yeah. And we, we can help with the family. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Hinn. I'm the city council president. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in, in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. Um, would also like to ask um, if we could all be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting uh, while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave. And if you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Please also note that according to city council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Arroyo, present. Councilor Baker, here. Councilor Block, Councilor Brady, here. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, here. Councilor Clarity, here. Councilor Flynn, here. Councilor Lara, here. Councilor Louis Jen, present. Councilor Mejia, here. Councilor Murphy, here. And Councilor Worrell, present. We have a quorum. Thank you. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Introduction of today's clergy. Um, it is Associate Pastor uh, Samuel Savato from the Lion of Judah, um, was invited by City Councilor Arroyo. Uh, Councilor Arroyo, would you like to come up to the podium and introduce our clergy today? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Samuel Acevedo is an associate pastor at the Church of Leon de Juda, where he leads several social justice efforts aimed at influencing Latino society in New England for the kingdom of God. To that end, Pastor Sam serves as the founding executive director of the church-based Boston Higher Education Resource Center, also known as HERC, uh, dedicated, to, dedicated to the ministry of helping our, our, our children and young people go to college. Acevedo has served as the executive director of the Boston Higher Education Resource Center since its founding in 1999 and is the founding co-chair of the Boston School Committee's Opportunity Advancement GATT Task Force and recently served on Superintendent's Search Committee, which helps select Brenda Casilius. He holds a bachelor's degree from Stetson University and a JD cum laude from Boston College Law School. Prior to his current role, Sam served as an assistant corporation counsel litigating juvenile delinquency cases in New York City's family court until joining the staff of the Congregacion Leon de Judá in 1999. Sam also serves on the board of the Ten Point Coalition, the Boston Trinity Academy, and the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary Center for Urban Ministry and Education. He and his wife Marina were married in July of 2001, uh, and I'm very honored to have him here today. Thank you, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Arroyo, esteemed city councillors in the city of Boston, listening in. Let's go before the presence of God. Heavenly Father, we lay the city of Boston at your feet. You're all too well aware of where it's hurting. You see our schools and the many children who are hurting. And there's so much uncertainty, God, this Desi thing, etc. You see our opioid crisis and our crisis of homelessness, you hear those souls crying out to you now. Most of us, when it becomes more than we can take or bear, have the luxury of turning our eyes and turning our faces away from what overwhelms us. But the men and women in this room do not have that luxury. The people of Boston have laid on them the burden of leading this city. They cannot put what overwhelms us behind them. 
and since they have no choice but to lead heroically, I ask you, Yeshua, let them lead this city as you would. Let them bring healing to others as you did. Let them love on others as you did. Let them love their enemies and bless those who persecute them as you did. Let them speak the truth in love and love in righteousness as you did. Let them honor the Father and honor your word as you did. They have invited you today, this body. And I do that. I invoke your presence, Holy Spirit, over this chamber, over everyone in this room, and over the city of Boston, that today, this 11th of May, 2022, may Boston resemble heaven a little more than it did yesterday. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And if we're able to rise and uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor, for those words and for the prayers and for your leadership, Pastor, as well in, the, in this city. Thank you, Council Arroyo, for bringing the Pastor forward. Um, at this time, yeah, and please, Ms. Mr. Clark, please let the attendants reflect that Council Bach is here. At this time, I would like to call up Council Liz Braden for a special presentation. Council Braden. And also would like to invite uh, Council Braden's guests as well. Thank you, President Flynn, for considering my request to make a presentation this afternoon. Uh, for my colleagues who may not be familiar with the history of the Faneuil Branch Library in o Brighton's Oak Square, um, the building itself is an Art Deco building of architectural significance, which was built in 1931 in the middle of the Great Depression. The Friends of the Faneuil Branch Library Group was formed in 1988 in response to the city's threat to close the library due to budget cuts. And the library supporters of all ages mobilized the community to raise funds in order to temporarily keep the library open as a reading room until operating funds were eventually reinstated. And in 19, 2009 and 10, and, ex, and the, the very existence of the Faneuil Branch Library was again threatened by budget cuts when 30 employees were laid off and the BPL and the Mayor Menino proposed closing four BPL branches, Lower Mills in Dorchester, Washington Village at Old Colony in Southie, and the Orient Heights in Eastie. The Friends Group and community put up a colossal fight and amounted our Save Our Library campaign, and community meetings were, uh, had over 450 attendees and stood up to Mayor Menino. And eventually, BPL was convinced that the Faneuil Branch Library was an asset to the Oak Square community. The Faneuil Branch Library is now finally getting a much needed renovation. Uh, it has been uh, in the city's capital project portfolio for renovations since 2006. And we look forward to reopening the library next spring. The community process and study finally started in 2014 and the design phase in 2019-2020. And the library has closed, right now is closed for renovations. And we look forward again, as I said, to it reopening next year. 
An integral part of the campaign to save the library has been Maria Rodriguez, Maria, and the entire uh, Rodriguez Rao, um, Ram Rao family. They were incredibly involved in the in the community um, campaign to save our library, and they were have been fierce community advocates. I want to recognise the members of the Rodriguez Rao family, who were with us in the central chamber, in the council chamber this afternoon, and um, as well as those currently watching by live stream from Brazil. Today, I offer a resolution for the council to vote in support of formally naming the children's room in the renovated Faneuil Branch Library of the Boston Public Library as JJ's room in memory of Maria and Ram's son, J. Ram Miguel Rodriguez Rao. J. Ram was eight years old and mobilizing on the front lines as an activist during the height of the campaign to save our library in Oak Square in 2010. His passion for justice grew as he developed into an environmental activist. He played drums and guitar and was an avid woodworker, loved the outdoors and was deeply involved with the uh, Junior Classical League at Boston Latin School, representing Boston and winning the highest levels of Latin classics in Latin classics tournaments. He worked with the Olmsted Center for Landscape Preservation, where he developed his interest in this, for the stewardship of the national park system. And when he graduated from Boston Latin School in 2019, he was headed to BU to pursue a degree in environmental science. J. Ram's life was tragically lost on July 2nd, 2019, on a family trip to Brazil, while pursuing his passion for adventure and rock climbing. For all in our community who knew him, we have been devastated and heartbroken. As a member of the Youth on Board and the Boston Student Advisory Council's Climate Justice Team, he provided powerful testimony at the City Council hearing on March 2019 on the importance of centering young people in the climate justice movement and taking bold policy actions just three uh, months before he, unex he unexpectedly passed. I would. At this point, I'd like to ask central staff to please play a recording of his testimony at that hearing. Okay, Jaram, well, Jaram please. It was with BSAC, so, so you know what, Jaram, rather than standing up there, grab a seat right up here. If your colleague wants to get a picture, they can come on the floor too. Absolutely, please. Good afternoon, and thank you to the city councilors and organizers present. My name is Jay Ram Rao, and I'm a senior at the Boston Latin School. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Boston Student Advisory Council and Youth on Board, an organization composed of students like myself who care deeply about the future of our city. I'll begin with a brief story. The environment was always important to me. I recycled and turned off the tap and helped my dad install LED lights. But the environment didn't dominate every waking hour of my mind. But lately it does. Around this time last year, I was sitting in the front row of my AP environmental science class. The lights were off, and the title of a film burned bold against the projector screen. Before the flood. I remember my teacher saying, this is the most important thing I'm going to show you all year. I believed him to an extent. I thought perhaps we were going to see the key chart or graph that would help us ace the AP exam in a few months. But it ended up being a lot more than that. Images of smog-choked cities, coastal flooding, and rivers on fire struck me in a way that they hadn't before. All I could imagine was smog so thick it obscured the Hancock Tower, the aquarium knee-deep in seawater, and the Charles River so clogged with trash and oil that it burns for days. That day, everything we had studied in the past seven months became very, very real. In fact, and I don't say this lightly, my life gained purpose that day because that was the day I became angry. I began to look in my own city for those who profit off the destruction of our environment. And who did I find but fossil fuel giants like ExxonMobil, BP, and Shell? According to the city's environment department, public, commercial, and residential buildings account for 70.6% of citywide greenhouse gas emissions. The net zero buildings plan is a real and viable opportunity to reduce the city's total emissions by millions of metric tons per year. We would be well on track to meet our emissions goals for the coming decades. 
You all here today have the opportunity to make a significant dent in our city's carbon emissions by bringing every new structure into the 21st century before contractors even break ground. The Net Zero Buildings Plan is more than just desirable, it's necessary. Luckily for us, it can be implemented with a modicum of willpower on your part, and the returns on investment will be both immediate and long-lasting for every citizen of Boston. Six days ago, hundreds of young people, nearly all of whom will be voting in 2020, demonstrated outside the State House for climate action. Our votes will speak loudly next year, and they will tell you what our future will look like. This is our chance to make a significant step in the right direction, because if anyone can do it, a city of scientific innovators, engaged citizens, and responsive legislators like Boston can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you know where you're headed, uh, what your plans are for next year? Boston University. So Good man. Good, excellent. Be you. Could I just say, um, I think you should, if, did you prepare that just for here, or had you? You should just edit slightly some of the, submit it as an op-ed somewhere. I think it's really important for everyone to read it, and I'd love to follow up to suggest maybe places that would publish it immediately, but you should put that in. And the only other comment that I have is, don't forget that it's not just about 2020. This year matters a lot for elections too, and that there are now multiple open seats on the council and other places, so these races are incredibly important for climate policy too, so um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wood. In J. Ram's memory, the annual lecture on environmental racism and justice and the J. Ram Miguel Rodriguez Rao Prize for work on environmental racism and justice was established by the Environmental Studies Program at the College of the Holy Cross in his honor. So today, I, um, I want to offer uh, a resolution supporting the naming of the children's room in the Faneuil Branch Library of the Boston Public Library as J. Ram's, JJ's room in memory of J. Ram Miguel Rodriguez Rao. Shall I just keep going? Okay. Thank, thank you, Councilor Braden. Um, for the record, we will, out of, out of order, we will take docket 0615. Mr. Quirk, if you may, will you please read docket 0615? Docket number 0615, Councillor Braden offered the following. Resolution supporting the naming of the children's room in the Faneuil branch of the Boston Public Library as JJ's room in memory of J. Ron Miguel Rodriguez Rao. Thank you, Mr. Quirk. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to make uh, a presentation um, to uh, the Rodriguez Rao family. Uh, uh, today, I offer the resolution for the Council to vote in support of naming the children's room in the renovated Faneuil Branch Library of the Boston Public Library as JJ's room in memory of uh, J. Ram. J. Ram lived every day as if it was his last fighting the urgency of climate change and environmental justice, and touching the lives of so many. Naming the children's room in his honor is just one way our community will help keep his spirit in our hearts and in a public space which will serve the youth he so fiercely advocated for. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for suspension of the rules and passage of this resolution today, and I request a roll call vote in this, as this will be for the naming of a public space. Thank you. Th thank you, Council Braden. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, bon dia, senores Rodrigues. Senhora e senhor Rodrigues, meu nome é Tani Fernandes Anderson e sou aqui um city councilor e queria só Obrigada por tudo o trabalho que o seu filho fez. E sou muito orgulhosa. Não sabia a sua, sua história, mas muito obrigada. Um, I just wanted to wholeheartedly endorse uh, Council Braden's offering on um, Jairam. And uh, just a brilliant thinker. I looked him up, a rock climber, just a phenomenal student, and um, wholeheartedly support you. Muito obrigada por seu filho, tá? Obrigada. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Councilor Lujan. Councilor Lujan, you um, have the floor. I just am rising to just say I wholeheartedly support this resolution. I know how big both of your hearts are, 
and how big your family is and how much of a loss this was not only to you but to the city of Boston. So I just want to say my heart is with you. Um, whatever I can do to support the renaming voting yes here, I do that. Um, and I'm so glad that both of you are here today. So thank you, Councilor Braden, for bringing them to the chambers. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Would anyone else like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell, and please add the chair. Council Braden is seeking suspension of the rules of adoption 0615. Mr. Clerk, can we take a roll call vote? Yep. <clears throat> roll call on docket 0615. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Lara? Councilor Lujan, yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. and Councilor Worrell. Yes. Unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Can my colleagues join us for a picture, please? Thank you, Councillor Braden, and thank you to this wonderful family that has contributed so much to our, to our city. Um, Mr. Clerk, we're going to go back to docket 0607, communications from Her Honor, the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0607, please? Okay. I apologize about that, I jumped, jumped the gun. We're now on to the order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. 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 All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, thank you. The meeting, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. We're, we're on to Communications from Her Honor, the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0607, please? Docket number 0607, message in order amending the City of Boston Code, ordinances section 9-9, uh, section 12, inspection of exterior walls and appurtenances of buildings requiring periodic inspection. This ordinance provides the Inspectional Services Department ISD with an important tool to ensure the ongoing safety and professional inspection of building facades across the city of Boston, filed in the office of the city clerk on May 9th, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. In docket 0607 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read <coughs> docket 0608 through 0610 together. Docket number 0608, message in order for the confirmation of the renewal appointments of constables 
authorized to serve civil process upon the filing of their bonds for a period commencing May 1st, 2022 and ending April 30th, 2025. Docket number 0609. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of new constables authorized to serve civil process upon the filing of their bonds for the period commencing May 1st, 2022 and ending April 30th, 2025. And docket number 0610. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of renewal inspectional services constables authorized to serve civil process upon the filing of their bonds for the period commencing May 1st, 2022 and ending April 30th, 2025. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty, chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Uh, we're going to move for suspension and passage on that, Mr. President. Council Flaherty seeks suspension of the rules and passage of confirmation of docket. Um, you're doing all the dockets? Correct, Council yes, 06, uh, 6, 0607, 0608, 0609, and 0610. Okay. They uh, play a vital function in our city, and uh, it's important that we move those along. Eight, nine, eight, yeah, 8, 9, and 10, I eight, believe. 8, 9, and 10. 8, 9, and 10, correct. Okay. Um, Council Flaherty seeks suspension of the rules in confirmation of docket 0608. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Flaherty seeks suspension of the rules in confirmation of docket 0609. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Flaherty seeks suspension of the rules and confirmation of docket 0610. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0611 to 0614. Docket number 0611. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Alexandra L. Lawrence as Deputy Chief of Administration for the City of Boston, effective May 9th, 2022. Docket number 0612. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Santiago Grasses as the Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston, effective May 9th, 2022. Docket number 0613. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Jose Masso as Chief of Human Services for the City of Boston, effective May 9th, 2022. In docket number 0614, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance of chapter six of the ordinances of 1979, relative to action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of April 27, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Docket 0611 through 0614 will be placed on file. Reports of committee. The committee report has been withdrawn. Docket 0376 will remain in committee. Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0480 to 0482, docket 0483, and docket 0484 to 0486 together. Docket number 0480 through 0482. Orders for the fiscal year 23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, OPEP. Docket number 0483, order for capital fund transfer appropriations. And docket number 0484 through 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, chair of the committee in Ways and Means. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the committee on Ways and Means continue to hold or continued to hold hearings this week to review the FY23 budget. We have held four public hearings uh, so far this week 
On Monday, we have Public Works Department and the Boston Transportation Department as well as from, as well as um, Inspectional Services Department. Yesterday, we heard from the Mayor's Office of Housing and the Office of Fair Housing and Equity, and as well as Boston Fire Department. Um, just a quick note, tomorrow uh, we will hear from Boston Police Department. In the morning, we will hear from Boston uh, Police Commission Office, Bureau of Professional Development, Bureau of Professional Standards, Bureau of Community Engagement, and Bureau, Bureau of Field Services. In the afternoon, we will hear about the Bureau of Admin and Technology, Bureau of Investiga Investigative Services, and Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis. And um, this afternoon, uh, for those of you um, who uh, would like to join, and, and, and I look forward to meeting with all of my colleagues, uh, we will have our first working session to discuss the FY23 budget um, at 3 p.m. in the Piemonte Room. Over the next weeks, we will continue to review FY23 budget and um, with additional departmental hearings and council working sessions. I recommend that these matters remain in committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Docket 0480 to 0482, docket 0483, docket 0484 to docket 0486 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0616. Docket number 0616, Councilors Mejia and Lara offer the following. Order for a hearing on workforce development housing for City of Boston employees. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Council. Council, which one? Council Worrell. So ordered. Council Worrell is uh, added as the third co-sponsor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor Lada for co-sponsoring this hearing order alongside our office, as well as Councilor Worrell for joining us. The City of Boston employs close to 20,000 workers, and most of them are required to live in the city. But as housing prices continue to rise, wages remain where they have been for decades. And we have to start asking ourselves, how is it possible that our city employees um, are able to afford to live here? In our office, many of our staff have had to live in subsi subsidized housing or live with two, three, and even four roommates just to be able to afford the rent at the end of the month. The federal poverty, poverty level for a family of four in the United States is 27,750. And in Boston, a 70% AMI, which is the cap for most affordable housing, for a family of four is 84,550. Looking through Boston's payroll, we found that there are over 7,500 employees who are making just below the poverty level, but not enough to be able to support themselves or their families without the help of subsidized housing. This is unacceptable. It is not fair for us to require City of Boston employees to live in the city and not provide adequate means to achieve housing security. Now, I personally don't think that we should do away with housing requirement. I think it's important for us to live in the city that you are tasked um, to serve, but we clearly need to be doing better to boost wages and include and increase housing affordability for everyone, but especially those who are legally required to live here. This is a housing issue, and it's also a workforce development issue, and it's also a mental health issue. Nobody should ever have to make the choice between food or housing or heat or, or um, medical bills um, or housing. We have to do better. I look forward to this conversation and to working alongside Councilor Lada on all things housing. Um, I, just, I just wanted to just quickly also uplift the fact that um, you know, we, we, we hear from a lot of our city employees about all of the discrepancies that exist here in the city of Boston, but at some point we have to lean into it and say, what are we going to do about it? And I think this is an opportunity for us to really have a conversation and figure out what more um, can we do than just um, have a hearing, right? Um, where are the investments and how we are going to lean into this um, 
conversation in a way that is going to uplift the voices that we've been hearing. This was really inspired, um, this conversation in particular, uh, a few years ago, I had someone on my Instagram live who was a, who is still a City of Boston employee and has to work two, to, two jobs just to be able to, to stay here. And she loves her job. Um, and we should not be creating financial hardships for those who are serving our community. We need to really um, hold ourselves accountable uh, to, to addressing this issue in a way that it's going to invest um, in workforce development housing. So I look forward to working alongside my colleagues um, to doing just that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to my co-sponsors on this matter. Um, a fact that will surprise absolutely no one, the city of Boston sits among the top 1% most expensive cities globally and ranks 26 as the most expensive city in this country. We are not currently paying all of our employees an equitable rate that aligns with their needs and the cost of living in the city, which presents an issue for not only securing but retaining talent that can meet our city's residency requirement. It impacts the diversity of our workforce and by extension, the quality of the services that we provide our constituents. Um, I'm really excited to work on this issue because I think that we need to get creative around solving the issues um, that we have. And short of requiring that the city pay a living wage that is in alignment with the cost of living in Boston to every employee, where's the camera, wink, um, we have to explore other solutions ultimately. And I'm really excited to work on this issue with Councillor Worrell and Councillor Mejia, and I hope that we can follow the example of other cities um, in securing affordable housing for everyone who works for the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lara. The chair recognizes Councillor Worrell. Council Worrell. You have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to my co-sponsors. Um, as we all know, housing is one of the top priorities here in Boston, and we see that reflected in our work on the council from ideas on increasing IDP, rent to own, um, and a home ownership voucher program. We are working on significant supports to increase affordability and access to housing for our residents. But it's important that we continue to be intentional in equipping our residents with tools to assist our friends, families, neighbors and colleagues who are stuck in the middle with a lack of affordable op options or real pathways to home ownership, but who are making too much for housing assistance. To attract and retain talent for our economy and ensure long-time residents do not become displaced, we must act to make home ownership a reality and housing affordable to all. I think it's important for us to explore how we can use local option and work with fair housing to see how we can create equity and priority ap applicants in our housing process. I'm encouraged by our mutual partnership, creativity, and attention to housing. I'm looking forward to working with all of us on this important matter. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Council Mejia, Council Lara, Council Worrell, for creating this dope ass idea. Um, I will be applying. And um, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Second of all, we need to change those crazy chairs. How are your backs, colleagues, my people? Like, it's bad. Everybody's back hurts on those chairs. And we are just not helping our um, employees. And they're awesome, and they're the best, and I support this. I had a, a pretty fancy speech, but you don't need, you don't need all that. Please put my name on this. Um, I support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, um, sign sign my name on and thank the sponsors for for this legislation. This is good legislation. Couple suggestions. We need to invite the unions because I believe this could be in um, grants to the unions that they're able to trickle down to their to their membership. Um, and also invite the credit union and the firefighters credit union. I bought my first house about 30 years ago, 1994. Um, of course, that was when nobody wanted to be in Boston. I think we had two or three abandoned houses on my street that I grew up on. I bought an abandoned house uh, with money from the credit union. Um, rehabbed it myself and lived in there for a while with roommates, but that was, that was what basically allowed me to subsequently 
you know, buy the house that I'm in now that I raised my family. But I think there are some, some good ideas. The Firefighters Credit Union just did some, some creative um, packaging where they um, came up with a new product. I don't know if it's a, I don't want to speak about it too much, but it, it may be a 40 year, 40 year term. But basically, what I found the most difficult thing in home ownership is that initial, that initial down payment. You really want to get 10%, 20% to avoid AMI, um, <clears throat> which, is, which is insurance, which adds to your, to your um, monthly payment. We have to be able to get people to a point where they can get that initial payment and then realize that even though the house may cost 550, 650, whatever it is, the monthly payment might only be 2,500 bucks or something like that. And we have to educate, educate people on that. But I think, again, not to keep hammering APA, APA, some of this APA housing money should go towards the unions where we demand the people that are making 30 grand stay in the city. How do they do it? How did I buy a house when I was only making 50 grand in Hatton and Hatton? I don't know how I did it, but I did it probably because of sheer stupidity and didn't realize that I could have put myself in the, in the, in the poor house my whole life, which I kind of did. But anyways, <laughs> uh, I've, go, I've, gone on, I've gone on long enough. But this is, this is good legislation. But I think it has to happen with real money that goes for the unions to be able to give to their, to give to their membership. Here, here's 25000 for a down payment. 50000 for down payment. Those are the ty that's the type of money that we're going to need to give to down payments. And that's not even talking about the supply. That's a whole other conversation. But thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the lead sponsor and the, the, the sign-on sponsors. Thank, thank you, Council Baker. The Chair recognizes Council Bork. Council Bork, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thanks again to the sponsors. Um, I think this is great legislation, and uh, I would, I, to me, it feels like, as Councilor Baker saying, something that actually links housing benefit to City of Boston employment um, and also I think looks for ways to leverage our public lands better. I know that the administration is doing a, a survey of sort of all the land we hold, but I know something that's come up a few times is, you know, are there opportunities with some of the excess spaces like land and parking lots that BPS owns to maybe put housing for teachers on site? Like I think thinking creatively about places where we could actually not only provide cash benefits, but also actually like create workforce housing for our city workforce is a direction I hope this will go. So please sign my name and thank you again to the sponsors. Thank you, Council Bork. The Chair recognizes Council Eugen. Council Eugen, you have the floor. Mr. President, and thank you to the makers for this uh, legislation. I think it's a great idea, workforce development. I also think that we also just need to be paying our employees a lot more money. Mm -hmm. um, I have been, you know, have so many conversations with folks offering them positions that I know them, like they, I know that they want to move to Boston, and I tell them what the potential salary is, and they're like, do you think I can make it? And I was like, honestly, no, and I, don't, and I can't in good conscience tell you to come work in my office, right? So we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we are, we are respecting the incredible work that my staff does, that I know everyone else's staff does, by making sure that they can find housing in this very ridiculously expensive city. So add my name, and I look forward to supporting this legislation. Thank you, Council Lujan. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Please add my name into the makers. Just uh, We had a hearing on residency. This was several yeah. years ago, and the law department came down saying that we couldn't do it, but they didn't have any case law to support it. So uh, through the chair of the makers, if they could, during the course of this hearing, bring the law department down mm -hmm. so they can't give us the swerve. Uh, and uh, it's a great idea. Uh, long overdue. We've got city employees that are, are the unsung heroes of our city, uh, scratching and clawing, and in some instances working two, three jobs just to be able to stay in the city. Uh, we know a lot of those folks. They're our constituents, our neighbors, our friends, some of our staff members. Uh, and so uh, long overdue, but we need obviously to get clarity uh, because we raised this very issue during the residency hearing a few years ago and uh, kind of got a little stiff arm from the law department. So I would ask that the law department be required to attend that hearing. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty, and, and, and I will speak on this as well. Um, I also think it's a, a great proposal. Um, just want to echo what Councilor Flaherty and Councilor Baker mentioned. Just, just a side story, I was visiting a, a friend up at the Gavin House um, yesterday. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, residential program for 
for, for people sub, with substance use um, challenges. And one of, the, one of the men that was leaving there said to me, Councilor Flynn, you, you proposed that uh, Office of Returning Citizens should be able to get a fair shot at working at, in the city at Public Works. The city should be more quarry friendly. And I said, yes, I, I did say that. I think it would be a, a, a great idea. He said, well, that would mean that we would have to live in, in the city of Boston for 10 years, making a salary of, I don't know what they start at, at $30,000, $35,000. So, you know, we can say that we want to help returning citizens. We can help them with quarry, quarry reform. But then we're going to make them live in Boston on a salary of thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. It just the math just doesn't add up. So, just wanted to highlight that maybe that's an issue we can also focus on. But again, I want to say thank you to my colleagues, the makers, for their uh, their important work on this. This is this will be a great hearing. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to speak or add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, please add Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Murphy, and the Chair. <clears throat> Docket 0616 will be assigned to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0617, please. Docket number 0617. Councilor Mejia offered the following, order for a hearing on government transparency and accountability towards service provision and spending on ELL students. The chair, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would like to add Councilor Arroyo as an original co-sponsor. So ordered, Councilor Arroyo is added. Thank you. Um, and before I dive into my, my speech, I just wanted to thank all of my colleagues for your enthusiasm and your support and really do look forward to uh, bringing all of your voices and all of the feedback. I took notes um, in regards to the previous uh, hearing order and I'm really grateful for it. And I also wanted to just um, quickly acknowledge that, you know, in this chamber, I've learned a lot. And one thing that I have learned um, more recently is really this need for transparency. And I think one of the things that I always um, ad admire and, and appreciate um, from Councillor Baker is his ability to really hold the city accountable and, and to demand transparency. And I think that's a lesson that we can all learn here as we continue to navigate. So in the spirit of um, accountability and transparency, um, I think that we all need to do a better job at, at making sure that we're holding ourselves to that standard. And so. The committee that we created um, for this term was designed to do just that, is to really look at um, the services, the, the accessibility of some of our resources, um, how people navigate city services, accountability. Are we holding ourselves accountable to the promises that we've made? What is the transparency around the dollars that we're spending here in the city? And I think that the committee that we've created um, we hope to be able to put it to good use around some of the issues that we are all have been here fighting on. And one in particular for me is around the issues around ELLs, um, which, is, which are English language learners. I myself am an English language learner. I learned how to speak English watching Sesame Street um, and had to be the official translator for my entire block. Um, and so we're here today to talk about, and I was also appointed to the ELL task force um, when I was uh, doing advocacy in the education space. So when we talk about English language learner students, we tend to view it as from the lens of education. But today, I want to look at how we as a city are providing care for our students from the lens of government accountability and transparency. Because we're in this budget season and we're seeing all of these numbers come in um, about how much we're spending to support English language learner, um, students or students with disabilities, but how that money really impacts our students is often a lot harder to unpack, especially when we have so much talk about uh, this in our budget hearings. Let's talk about some facts. A December report in 2021 reported 
um, report submitted to the Department of Justice from Boston Public Schools found that more than 11,000 English language learners in Boston Public Schools, 30% are not receiving enough of the right instruction with a certified teacher surrounded by the right group of students. And in Boston, there are roughly 4,000 English learners with disabilities who, have, who often have to choose between receiving support for their disability or their language needs. This is important because as we know, there's so much siloing of issues in our city, but we need to be intentional about breaking down those silos to support the whole child. And it's clear that we need to be doing more to support our English language uh, students from an accountability and accessibility perspective. So I'm hoping that we can have a worthwhile conversation with the administration and for, um, from advocates to learn about how we can move beyond just the conversation around funding and really look at the social and emotional supports of our EL students, especially EL students with disabilities. And I just want to give a shout out to um, John Mudd, uh, who um, has been a fierce advocate in the entire ELL task force. Um, for meeting with our office and bringing this issue to light. We hope that during this hearing we'll uncover what we need to do and how we need to move accordingly to support our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Thank you, Council Mejia, for your years of work uh, for English language learners uh, and continuing that work here on the Council. Uh, I myself began my political activism around English language learning. Uh, my mother was an English language teacher, uh, English language learning teacher in BPS, uh, and the UNS initiative came to town when I was a child. Uh, but it's a truth that we weren't doing right by English language learners even before UNS. UNS just devastated uh, the way in which we continue to do that work. Now, since 2017, since the Look Act has passed, it's really important that we make up ground um, as recently as the last five, six years, we ranked uh, as a state 49th uh, out of 50 states when it came to English language learners. Uh, and 30% of BPS is made up of English language learners. It's, it's also traditionally, though COVID has impacted this, traditionally English language learners uh, had been the largest growth part of BPS uh, in terms of new enrollment. Uh, and so making sure that we do right by English language learners, making sure that we're on top of it. Uh, we've seen the instability at the uh, Office of English Language Learners at DPS. Uh, we've sort of seen how in the budget uh, it's been difficult for them to pin down exactly where and how this money specifically impacts that 30%. Uh, and so this kind of a hearing I think is appropriate considering the urgency of the issue, the size of the population for our schools and the fact that we really do need to do a lot of work to get this right uh, and to do right by our kids uh, in Boston Public Schools who are learning a second language, uh, that second language being English, uh, and getting, getting through our testing and the things that we have. We know that there's conversations about uh, increasing the, the, the passing rate or the, rather the score required to pass for MCAS, and we know that that uh, would have devastating results on a lot of our English language learners. Uh, already, and so these are the kinds of things that uh, we have to make sure we're preparing children uh, today to be able to perform the way we would like them to perform in our schools uh, with the supports and the stabilizations they need, while also making sure we advocate to protect them in other ways in which our systems are, are dealing with them. So I look forward to this hearing. Uh, I think, again, Councilor Mejia and, and other members of this council have stood up uh, for English language learners throughout uh, their time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. Would anyone else don't like to speak in this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, unlike my council colleague um, Mejia, I came when I was 10, so I did not learn English through Sesame Street. It was the Honeymooners and Three's Company that taught me English. But um, for me, English is my fourth language, and I don't know that people know that. So it's, um, I mean, I was just talking to my colleague yesterday about the difficulty of students and just the spirit of uh, representing all the CV. I am Cape Verdean, and my, my first language is Cape Verdean Creole. And understanding that I had to learn Portuguese, you know, as a second language, and then coming to America and adapting and not going to school for an entire year, I had to learn Spanish to make friends. And then eventually learned English in school, and then took French in school, and then became Muslim and learned Arabic. So all of this you know, transitional stuff really does not interpret 
the nuances and the feeling of one's um, emotions or cultural context when you're speaking a different language. So I was telling, um, I was complimenting um, Council Mejia yesterday and saying, you are, uh, you're doing math, right? So you are calculating and multiplying and dividing and subtracting when you're speaking. And I really appreciate you that you stand here and you are really being wholeheartedly yourself and being a true self and always, you know, even when you explain um, let me say it this way, or my English this, or my English that. I actually connect with you on, on the same wave because I feel your heart, and I'm also doing a lot of math and interpreting things in multiple languages before I can actually get it out. So in the spirit of that, um, for the first time here in this chamber, I like to say this in my um, language, if you guys will allow me. Um, Si non si non sa bene mia capriana, non sa lì qualche cosa che non smea sti, signora Mejia come consigliere di municipal, e sta lì per rappresentare non sa me sobri meninos che stanno studiando na scuola, ta prendi outra língua. E também importância de ter que lo necessidade, que la abertura de fala na nos língua e também para não ter uns serviços na escola que não pode aprender outra língua. So, muito obrigado, senhor Mestre, por qualquer ajuda, nos chamam ali na oficina de Câmara Municipal, Tani Fernandes Anderson. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, Council Fernandes Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Uh, the chair recognizes Council Lujan. Council Lujan. You have the floor. Thank you. I just rise in support. You know, it's really important for us to really understand what our English language learners bring to the table, um, and that what they bring is, is a really big asset, right? What we're talking about folks who can speak another language, uh, you know, that's bringing diversity to a classroom into a different setting. When we look at our schools that have dual immersion programs, they are very long wait lists because parents recognize that as an asset. Um, if we have a population that is 30% of our public school system, um, they should be receiving equivalent, if not more, resources. And so just rise in support of the transparency around the numbers. Um, you know, we're going to have a breakfast here on Friday to celebrate um, Haitian Flag Day, and we're going to have students from the dual immersion classroom come and show us what it looks like to live in a, and be in a classroom where those assets are really celebrated. And so um, it's important that as we have this conversation, we realize why native language instruction is important. Uh, we realize why we need to support our students with interrupted uh, learning um, and make sure that they're able to access resources and that we need to put our money into the programs for our most vulnerable students, whether it's in language classes or in the facilities that they have, it is, we're, we're just not doing enough. And so support uh, this hearing order just so that we can get better numbers on what we are and aren't doing. So thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. Anyone else like to speak on this or add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clark, please add uh, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Rell, Councilor Murphy. Please add the chair as well. Um, Docket 0617 will be assigned to the committee. Well, let me, let me step back. Originally, I was going to assign it to the Committee on Education since the hearing discussed BPS and English language learners. But after listening to Councilor Mejia, um, I changed my mind, and I'm putting it in the Committee on Government Accountability, Transparency, and Accessibility. Mr. Cork, please read Docket 0618, please. Docket number 0618, Council Lara offer the following. Resolution calling for an end to the U.S. embargo against Cuba and opening up new travel and collaborative cultural, medical, and academic opportunities between the two countries. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I'm excited to present this resolution here today. Um, I'm going to give a little background. Um, on February 3rd, and I'm sure that most people know this, on February 3rd in 1962, uh, President John F. Kennedy imposed the U.S. embargo on Cuba. The 60th anniversary of the embargo is a stark reminder of the United States policy failures and one of the longest lasting series of sanctions in its foreign policy history. Today, more than half a century since the embargo was put in place, the Biden administration continues to uphold uh, what is ultimately a symbol of hostility between the US and Cuba amid the most challenging humanitarian crisis on the island since the 1990s. 
In 2009, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimated that the embargo cost the United States economy $1.2 billion per year in lost sales and exports. The Cuban government estimates that the embargo has cost the island $144 billion as of 2021. In 2014, the Obama administration lifted restrictions for Cuban Americans to travel and send family don donate re remittances, excuse me. English is not my first language, so sometimes I put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllables. Uh, Re-established the U.S. Embassy in Havana, removed Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list. It also expanded access to the internet, it licensed a range of trade opportunities for U.S. companies, and beyond these specific policies, the shift in discourse by U.S. presidential, by a U.S. president, excuse me, really signaled uh, what we consider to be the most significant change in U.S.-Cuba policy in 60 years. It also led to 23 bilateral accords on issues that the United States and the government of Cuba consider of mutual interest. Of course, the Trump administration, um, with a, like with a lot of other things, undid all of that progress and imposed new restrictions. I am filing this resolution today because this embargo uh, particularly complicates humanitarian assistance to Cuba. The complex licensing requirements effectively prevent food, medicine, and medical equipment from reaching Cubans, and it discourages medical equipment sales to the islands. One particularly egregious example of this is that um, Cuba had a cancellation of um, ventilator sales by a Swiss company uh, during the pandemic. These restrictive policies make it extremely difficult to send aid to Cuba, and it has damaged the Cuban healthcare system's ability to respond effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic, and ultimately has had a toll on human lives. Although their development, including the research production and rollout, was delayed because purchases of necessary supplies, shipping, were complicated by the embargo, Cuba managed to develop its own COVID-19 vaccines. The Biden administration's show of empathy with other countries during the pandemic led them to issue exemptions to certain sanctions that were already interfering with public health responses in Iran, Syria, and Venezuela, but these same efforts were notably absent uh, with Cuba. Despite all of these obstacles, Cuba has achieved a 90% vaccination rate with the vaccines that it developed. The city of Boston is home to some of the leading medical, um, public health and academic institutions in the entire country. And I think we would greatly benefit from the restoration of trade with Cuba by permitting the scientific, biopharmaceutical, medical and public collaboration and exchange, including the importation of Cuban products useful to Boston such as life-saving medicines like Herbaport P, which is a medicine that treats um, diabetic um, foot ulcers, and Simavax, which is the Cuban-developed vaccine against lung cancer. I think this is an incredible learning opportunity for the city council and our constituents. I think that there's an opportunity here to work towards dispelling myths about Cuba, about the embargo, about socialism, and which is why I'm not requesting a suspension of the rules today for this resolution, and I would like to hold a hearing instead. I look forward to ongoing collaboration with my colleagues on this matter and to further building solidarity with the Cuban people. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Alex, I'm so happy that you sit right across <laughs> me, <laughs> Mr. Clark, because I enjoy you too. Um, <laughs> so, Councilor you know, Lara is offering this uh, resolution, and at the risk of sounding ridiculous, um, <laughs> let me say that the true city councilor is guided by great feelings of love for this offer to put forward yes. by Councilor Lara. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Those who have visited my office understand <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> it is past time that we end the embargo on Cuba. The embargo does no good while causing great harm to the people of Cuba. The idea that the embargo is maintained to support human rights is pre pre preposterous, as the federal government has supported far more brutal reg regimes over the years, including Suharto in Indonesia, Pinochet in Chile, um, Mobuto in Zaire, Congo, and many others. Um, additionally, Cuba has world-class health, education, sports, tourism uh, that could mutually benefit to both of our countries. Um, in short, I support uh, my counselor, 
Lara in bringing this forth and end the embargo on Cuba. Um, additionally, I just want to say Cuba actually offers way more supports to tiny little archipelago of 10 islands in Cape Verde in west coast of Africa than any other country in the world. And it is the reason why Cape Verde actually has um, doctors and teachers and professors and lawyers. So out of all the countries, Cuba, tiny little Cuba, is the reason why Cape Verde actually has doctors and hospitals. So um, again, I support this 100%. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Anyone else like to speak on the matter or sign on to the matter if you raise your hand, please? Um, Mr. Clerk, please, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell, please add the chair. This docket will be assigned to the Committee on Labor, Workforce, and Economic Development. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0619, please. Docket number 0619, Councilors Braden and Murphy offer the following. Resolution recognizing May 6th through 12th, 2022 as National Nurses Week. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair now recognizes uh, Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move to sus uh, for suspension of the rules and to add Councillor Flynn as a, uh, an original co-sponsor, please. Uh, Councillor Flynn is so added. Uh, I offer this resolution today with Councillors Murphy and Flynn and recognize, to recognize May 6th uh, to 12th as National Nurses Week. Um, some of you may know that I come from a family of nurses. My mom was a nurse, her two sisters were nurses, and I spent my professional career as a physical therapist working alongside incredible, caring, dedicated nurses in hospitals, in the community, and in schools. In, in 1982, President Reagan proclaimed May 6th as National Nurses Day, and since 1990, National Nurses Week has run from May 6th through May 12th, the birthday of Florence Nightingale, who is regarded as the founder of modern nursing. In addition, May 8th is designated as National Student Nurses Day, and today, Wednesday of National Nurses Week, as National School Nurse Day. So nurses are everywhere. I also want to recognize and appreciate Councillor Murphy's leadership in bringing us um, uh, to recognize uh, Emergency uh, Medical Services Week, which is coming up. Nurses are public health heroes working to make our communities safer and healthier day in and day out, but certainly they are on the front lines of the pandemic as well. They, they have been in the trenches for the last two years, working and dealing with incredible stress um, and delivering care to those most in need during our pandemic. Over 10,000 nurses provide compassionate care and healing in hospitals and nurse medical centers located in the city of Boston, many of which are charitable and nonprofit hospitals, making contributions to our country communities, while others have, made con have been converted to, from non-profit status into non-profit entities, for-profit entities. I want to recognize uh, members of the, National, the Massachusetts Nurse Nurses Association. I was expecting some, but they don't they seem to have missed, they're not here today. But uh, I want to recognize them uh, for all their great work in advocating for uh, their nurses in, in all of our hospitals. As we celebrated, na celebrate National Nurses Week and recognize the contributions of those in the nursing profession, we must also call on hospital executives to pr provide safe working conditions and safe staffing levels for nurses and their patients. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. The chair now recognizes Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, so I am honored to call many nurses um, that family and friends nurses and as a Boston Public School kindergarten teacher you can just imagine that we spent many times in the nurse's office and it was oftentimes for a band-aid but also a hug and a kiss and they offer so much more than just the medical support they give so definitely want to shout out to all the school nurses and the nurses around 
the city around the world. So this year's theme is Nurses Make a Difference to honor the varying roles our nurses play in the healthcare field and the positive impact nurses have in our lives. I think we would all agree that we should celebrate our nurses every day and recognize the sacrifices they make. We know that they showed up on the front line throughout the global pandemic, risked their own lives to keep us alive, and they continue to show up. So I hope you all support this resolution, recognizing May 6th through 12th as National Nurses Week, because they deserve it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. The chair now recognizes Council uh, President Flynn. Thank you, Council Arroyo, and thank you to the um, sponsors. Thank you to Council Braden and Council <clears throat> Murphy for including me. I just want to echo what both of my colleagues mentioned, the incredible role nurses play in our city, in our society, in our country, especially during this pandemic. They've been on the front lines of the health care and providing exceptional support to so many people in need. All of my colleagues here in this body have been strong supporters of, of helping nurses across our city. Most recently, I was with Councilor Lujan at the um, Tufts Medical Center, where, they, where they're closing, believe this, believe this or not, they're closing the pediatric hospital um, at Tufts Medical Center. It's, it's, it's moving from Tufts over to children, children's, but it's going to be a huge loss of um, jobs for our nurses. But the nurses, Mass Nurses Association, play a critical role um, in making sure that nurses are treated with respect, that they have safe working conditions. It's a tough job, and uh, they do a tremendous job at it. So I just want to say thank you to the nurses say thank you to the nurses in our public school system as well. And I'm um, honored, honored to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flynn. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Councillor Fernandez-Anderson. I'm on fire today. Um, <laughs> for every battle, you need diplomats and warriors. And in my humble opinion, I think Teachers are the diplomats, the guardian angels um, of this world, and nurses are certainly the warriors. And um, shout out to um, Jennifer Carvalho, my auntie, um, and my uncle, all the nurses in my family, came in, all, all of them today. But um, shout out to all the nurses in my family, and you guys are lifesavers. I personally have worked with nurses overnight um, in the hospital setting, and they are they're like robots. They're like not even human. They just save lives. They keep their heads down. They work hard. They're sleep deprived. They just do it humbly without complaining and just keep going. And I thank you for all of your hard work and saving lives and keeping our city safe. I strongly support this resolution. And thank you so much to Councillor Murphy, Council Flynn, and Council Braden for um, filing this. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez-Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Seeing nobody, would anyone uh, else like to add their name? Uh, Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Baker. Please add Councillor Bach. Please add uh, Councillor Fernandez-Anderson. Please add Councillor Flaherty. Please add Councillor Lara. Please add Councillor Louis Jen. Please add Councillor Mejia. Please add Councillor Orell and please add my name. Uh, Councillors Braden, Murphy, and Flynn seek suspension of the rules and passage of docket 619. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0619 has been adopted. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Mr. Clark, please read docket 0620. Docket number 0620, Councillor Murphy offered the following. Resolution recognizing the contributions of the Boston Emergency Medical Services and recognize Boston Emergency Medical Services Week. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, and President, I'd like to suspend the rules and add Councilor Braden, if I could, please. So ordered, Councilor Braden is added. Thank you. Um, so the Boston Municipal Emergency Medical Services is one of three public safety agencies who respond to 911 calls in the city of Boston. Their department cares for patients with clinical proficiency, professionalism, and compassion, and is a recognized leader in EMS in the largest municipal EMS in New England. 
Members of the Boston EMS were on the front line during the COVID-19 pandemic and answered the call for over 126,000 clinical incidences in 160,577 total BLS and ALS responses and made 79,210 transports in 2021 alone. They serve residents across every neighborhood in the city and always show up professionally when needed. This year's national EMS theme, this week's theme is rising to the challenge, something members of the Boston EMS have exemplified, I think always, but especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I hope my colleagues, I hope you join me in honoring the contributions of the Boston Emergency Medical Service Department and recognize May 15th through the 21st to be Boston EMS Service Week. So I hope you all join me. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Councillor Murphy, for adding me to this resolution. Uh, I stand um, to recognize the incredible work of Boston EMS, the day in and day out, all hours, 24-7. They deliver essential services to our neighbors and uh, our communities across the city. The EMS, you know, we've been through this incredible once in a hundred years pandemic and the EMS uh, personnel of, Bo of Boston have been at the front line um, delivering professional care um, in a timely and um, efficient way and basically pre pre presenting as a bulwark against the, against the um, incredible impacts that this uh, pandemic has had on our communities. So I am very uh, proud to um, join you today uh, Councillor Murphy in recognising the incredible work that our EMS professionals do every day. I also write, as I'm standing uh, in my comments earlier, I did mention the incredible work of the Massachusetts Nursing Nurses Association and I just wanted to recognise uh, my dear friend Ellen McGuinness who is an M&A member um, at <laughs> St Elizabeth's Hospital in Brighton. So thank you for being here Ellen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Braden. Would anyone else like to speak on this? The Chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just wanted to rise, one, to ask to add my name. Um, I'm really excited that um, Councillor Murphy and Councillor Braden have put this resolution forth. As a lot of you know, a lot of my previous work was at the Boston Public Health Commission, and a part of the department that I worked in, our job was to educate all 1,100 employees at BPHC on racial justice and health equity values and how that would translate into their work, and that included the city of Boston's EMTs. They um, were an incredible group of committed, curious, and just dedicated individuals that, like has already been mentioned, work 24-7 to make sure that the people of our city are taken care of. I also wanted to stand to give a special shout out to Andrew Brown, who was one of our campaign fellows, uh, excuse me, our campaign fellows. Um, he is also an EMT, uh, an incredible um, abolitionist, and did a lot of our public safety research um, for our campaign. So I wanted to shout him out because doing his work as an EMT, he still found time to work on our campaign and do an incredible amount of research. So um, I would like to sign my name on vote in support of this resolution um, and show my gratitude to Andrew and all of the EMTs in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please add Council Lara. Um, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Please raise your hand, Mr. Clerk. Please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Council Bach, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Eugene, Council Mejia, Council Rell. Please add the chair. Um, Council Murphy and Council Braden seek suspension of the rules and adoption of 0620. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The doc docket has been adopted. We are on to personnel orders. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0621. Docket number 0621, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Ward. The World. Chair seeks suspension of the rules, passage of docket 0621. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0622. 
Docket number 0622, Council of Flame for Council of Fire. Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0622. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to late files. I am informed by the clerk that there is one late file matter. The late file matter includes a 17 order, a 17 F order from Council Baker. Um, the late file should be on everyone's desk. Um, we, it's not on everyone's desk. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, okay. <laughs> the late file is now on everyone's desk. We will take a vote to add this item into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matter into the agenda say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Um, the late file matter has been added into the agenda. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Yeah, okay. Baker. Um, at this time, the chair is, the uh, clerk is going to read the um, 17 F into the record, Mr. Clerk. Order of Councilor Frank Baker ordered that under the provisions of se Section 17 F of Chapter 452 of the Acts of 1948 as amended and any other applicable provision of law, the mayor be and hereby is requested to obtain and deliver to the city council within one week of the receipt hereof the following information relative to new city of Boston employees. One, who, have, who has been hired as a city of Boston employee since November 16, 2021, especially chiefs, department heads, and all mayoral staff, up to and including special assistants. And number two, what are the addresses of said employees? Filed in the Boston City Council, May 11, 2022. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a, <clears throat> a simple request, and it's about transparency, and, and we had talked about residency earlier. These are the highest paid. I'm looking more for the highest paid people that are coming into the city who we, were going, we are going to be dealing with directly, who we are going to need to um, work policy discussions with or, or a whole number of tasks that come across our desk. And also, this is about... Um, we had talked earlier about the lower, the, the lower rung of, the, of our workforce has to live here. The same is said about the, 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 the higher rung of our workforce. I'd like to know who they are, where they are, because um, residency is important to me. I think it was put in place years ago, years ago because we were just draining people in, in you know, I just think if people are going to be earning their money here, I think you have more skin in the game if you live in the game. If you, uh, I, I think that people are making, what do you say, for us, about us, without us. If they're living, if they're not living in our house, I don't want them making decisions about my house. So, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so, so pretty simple, pretty okay, simple there, okay. pretty simple there, uh, Mr. President. You're just looking to see who we're going to be dealing with on the, on the higher level and where they live. I believe they should be living in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Council Baker seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of the late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. We're on to green sheets. Um, can I take a, a quick brief, brief recess? <coughs> session, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Oh, I was just um, going to ask you to, uh, to uh, include a friendly, friendly amendment um, of including demographics and their pay so that we can, in, in the interest of are, equity. Are, you and, able, are we able to do that? I don't have a problem with it if we're able to do it. To do, do a motion of substitution. A motion of substitution, new language. Well, that's okay. That's all right. Make a motion, Frank. So I'd like to make I'd like to make a motion to include in my 17F 
demographics I, and salary. Salary. Salaries. I second. Is second. Okay. There's 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 a motion on the floor to include. I think we need to take a recess, a brief recess, Mr. President, if that's okay. So we, we do this right. We could take a brief recess. Okay.
We are back in session. We're going to recognize, I'm going to recognize Council Baker and uh, we're going to move for reconsideration. Um, we, yeah. At this time, I'm going to recognize Council Baker. Council Baker, thank you, you Mr. Floor. President. Again, I'm a little bit off my game. I apologize for the for, for the late for the late filing. I would like at this point like to move to reconsider the 17F order for some new language. We will now vote to accept that. We need a second. second. It's second. We will now vote to accept the reconsideration. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Okay, now, now, Mr. President, I'd like to file a motion to substitute the language for the 17F to include demographics and salaries. Is there a second? Second. Now that we have a second, we'll vote on the substitute draft of the 17F order. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Now, Mr. President, I would like to move for suspension and passage of the 17F. Thank you, Council Baker. Thank you. Um, Council vote, Council Baker um, is seeking suspending of the rules and passage of the substituted version of the 17F order. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. The consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are no additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for the adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been 
Adopted. Does anyone have any announcements at this time? Memorials. Today we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. Councilor Braden, Maureen Flaherty O'Rourke. Councilor Flaherty, Isabel Dominicone. Councilors Flaherty and Flynn, Carla Goret, Joan McDougall Collins, Marilyn Sullivan Strachan. For the entire City Council, Miguel Rodriguez Jevram. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in those mentioned, and we are now scheduled to meet again in the INL chamber on Wednesday, May 18th at 12 noon. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. The council is adjourned. Thank you to the city council central staff, and thank you to the clerk's office. Thank you.